stop everything. Have you heard about the P. Diddy scandal? The P. Diddy lawsuit, Puff Daddy, whatever you're calling him. And if you haven't heard about it, why? Because the media and Hollywood are clearly trying to bury it. The Diddy lawsuit is absolutely crazy. Full stop. What if I told you guys that it is about to get even crazier, that there is directly a link to Michael Jackson's death? Candace Owens has recently sparked a heated discussion with her bold claims, linking Diddy's latest legal battle to the mysterious death of Michael Jackson. During a recent episode of her podcast, Owens delved into the details of Diddy's legal troubles and expressed concern over what she perceives as a troubling silence from the media people were saying that Michael Jackson was killed. I actually know a lot of people that are in the industry who believe that Michael Jackson was killed. And I just thought, it just sounds too too whacked out to believe that there is allegedly some sort of a blackmail ring that is operating throughout Hollywood and that artists that are producing music are actually being controlled via being induced into drugs. In her outspoken manner, Owens raised eyebrows on social media, questioning the media's lack of coverage on Diddy's lawsuit compared to the infamous Jeffrey Epstein case. She suggested a potentially dark underbelly, insinuating that influential figures in Hollywood and politics might be facing blackmail to maintain a disturbing silence. The Bitcoin uh, millionaire who right before his death found drowned, accidental drowning, even though he was fully clothed and had his wallet in his pocket, tweeted that the CIA and the Mossad were running a blackmail ring. Owens went further to connect dots, pointing out that the individual allegedly involved in covering up Diddy's son's role in a shooting incident was also Michael Jackson's former head of security, present during the pop icon's untimely death. The conservative pundit hinted at extreme measures, even murder, being taken to protect the interests of those involved. This guy named Fahim Muhammad who before working for Diddy was the head of security for Michael Jackson when he was only 21. And he was one of the first people on the scene when Michael Jackson died. During her podcast, Owens highlighted five key takeaways from Diddy's lawsuit, arguing that its implications could surpass those of the notorious Jeffrey Epstein case. She took her concerns to social media, emphasizing the media's near silence on Diddy's legal battles, and suggesting a conspiracy involving politicians and celebrities facing blackmail. Doubled down on her assertions in a YouTube caption, Owens suggested a hidden agenda in Hollywood and the media to bury the Combs lawsuits, protecting high-profile individuals from scrutiny. While her claims have sparked both debate and skepticism, they shed light on the intricate power dynamics within the entertainment industry and the potential consequences of legal scandals involving influential figures. The news of Michael Jackson's death at the age of 50 in June 2009 left fans worldwide in shock. But there's a segment of enthusiasts who wonder if it was all an elaborate performance. Enter the realm of Jackson conspiracy theorists, often referred to as believers, who have consistently claimed that the iconic singer faked his own death and is still alive. In a curious twist, in early 2017, investment banker David Dunn testified in the U.S. tax court in Los Angeles, suggesting that Jackson was teetering on the edge of bankruptcy before his death. This added fuel to the speculation that the king of pop may have orchestrated his demise as a way to escape financial woes by assuming a new identity. Adding another layer to the mystery in 2017, Jackson's daughter, Paris, shared her conviction with Rolling Stone magazine that her father had been murdered. According to her, all arrows point to that. It sounds like a total conspiracy theory, and it sounds like bullshit, but all real fans and everybody in the family knows it. It was a setup. It was bullshit. This revelation raised questions among online conspiracy theorists, some of whom pondered whether she might be alluding to groups like the Illuminati. In 2012, five of the iconic singer's siblings, Janet, Rebby, Randy, Tito, and Jermaine, made headlines by signing a letter addressed to the executors of Jackson's estate, John Bronca and John McClain. Their accusations included fraud, forgery, exploitation, and abuse, which were boldly published on the gossip site Celebuzz. The crux of their argument was that Michael Jackson wasn't in Los Angeles on the day his will was supposedly signed, dated July 7, 2002, challenging the authenticity of the document. 
The siblings also claimed that Jackson had expressed disdain for Bronca and McLean, wanting them to play no part in his life. In response, representatives for the estate dismissed the allegations, expressing sadness over what they deemed false and defamatory accusations rooted in internet conspiracy theories. These accusations, they noted, were made by certain family members intentionally left out of Jackson's will. Delving further into the web of conspiracy theories, Latoya Jackson, Michael's sister, has been vocal about her belief in a plot to kill her brother. According to Latoya, Michael confided in her about the ominous feeling of impending danger, stating, Latoya, I'm going to be murdered for my music publishing catalog and my estate. Adding another layer to the intrigue last year, The Sun reported the existence of a note allegedly written by Jackson just weeks before his death. The note ominously conveyed, they are trying to murder me, with Jackson expressing fear for his life and asserting that the system wants to kill me for my catalog. These claims have sparked debates and fueled speculation around the circumstances surrounding Michael Jackson's demise and the mysteries that linger in the aftermath. The culprit? A lethal cocktail of drugs found in his system, including the anesthetic propofol. This substance had been administered by Jackson's personal doctor, Conrad Murray, for two months to address the pop icon's sleep troubles. Murray later faced the music in court and, in 2011, was deemed guilty of involuntary manslaughter, earning a two-year jail sentence. Before the trial, Murray's lawyer floated the idea that Jackson took drastic measures due to financial woes, but the judge shut down any attempts to delve into Jackson's financial records. Howard Weitzman, the lawyer representing Jackson's estate, raised an eyebrow at the notion of Michael committing suicide, calling it an unsellable theory. Meanwhile, a law enforcement official spilled the beans to ABC News, revealing that the star was deeply entangled with the painkiller OxyContin, receiving daily injections of the medication along with Demerol. It's a somber tale of a musical legend, ensnared by a web of substances that ultimately led to his untimely demise. In recent months, Sean Diddy Combs, the influential hip-hop billionaire, has faced a series of civil suits accusing him of sexual misconduct, including rape and assault. Once a symbol of affluence, Combs played a pivotal role in commercializing rap, turning his stake in the Bad Boy Entertainment record label into an empire spanning fashion, media, liquor, and more. In a clip from his 2017 documentary Can't Stop, Won't Stop, Combs asserted, Whatever I want, I have to get, showcasing his determined mindset. However, the recent accusations have cast a different light on his assertiveness, suggesting a potentially aggressive and domineering disposition. The lawsuits filed over the past few months present a challenging narrative that contrasts sharply with the image of the ultimate hustler mogul. A timeline spanning three decades juxtaposes key moments in Combs' career with allegations from the civil suits, revealing not only a troubling history of alleged violent behavior, but also the influence of power and celebrity in shielding him. In 1990, Combs began his music industry career as an intern at Uptown Records under executive Andre Harrell. The timeline takes a somber turn in 1991-1991 as a lawsuit from November 2023 alleges that Combs, along with R&B singer Aaron Hall, sexually assaulted an unnamed victim and a friend after a music industry event. Shockingly, the suit claims they later physically assaulted her when confronted. In 1991, another November 2023 lawsuit alleges that Combs drugged, sexually assaulted, and videotaped 19-year-old Joy Dickerson after a date. Despite these disturbing allegations, Combs continued to make strides in his career. In 1993, after being fired from Uptown Records, Combs launched his own label, Bad Boy Records, which went on to break the careers of notable artists such as Craig Mack, The Notorious Big, Mace, the Locks, and Faith Evans. However, the timeline takes a legal turn in 1996 when Combs was found guilty of criminal mischief for threatening a photographer from the New York Post with a gun. This incident provides a glimpse into a pattern of confrontations and legal issues that would come to define certain aspects of Combs' public persona. In 1998, Sean Diddy Combs kicked off his annual Hamptons All-White Parties, gaining a reputation as a modern-day Gatsby. 
These lavish and exclusive gatherings attracted a diverse guest list ranging from music industry executives and artists to actors, real estate moguls, and sports team owners. April 16, 1999, marked a significant turning point. Combs faced arrest and charges of second-degree assault and criminal mischief for allegedly beating record executive Steve Stout. Stout claimed that Combs and two bodyguards assaulted him with their fists, a telephone, a champagne bottle, and a chair. In a public apology, Combs reportedly paid Stout $500,000, leading to Stout requesting the dismissal of charges. The assault charge was dropped, and Combs pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of harassment, receiving a sentence of one day of anger management classes. Moving to December 27, 1999, Combs, accompanied by then-girlfriend Jennifer Lopez and rapper Shine, faced arrest in connection to a shooting at Club New York. While Combs was charged with weapons violations, he was eventually acquitted. March 2000 marked the debut of the reality TV competition Making the Band on ABC, later airing on MTV. The show, spanning 12 seasons, featured Combs searching for new talent to form bands like Day 26 and Danity Kane, both signed to Bad Boy Records, and became a cultural staple for MTV. On March 26, 2001, local TV host Roger Mills filed a lawsuit against Combs, accusing him of assault, false imprisonment, destruction of property, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and civil conspiracy. The allegations stemmed from an incident where Combs's entourage allegedly roughed up Mills and destroyed his camera. In response, a Combs spokesperson stated that they couldn't comment on specific allegations as they hadn't been served with the complaint. Despite the legal battle, a jury found in favor of Combs in 2004, dismissing the allegations as baseless and an attempt to exploit his celebrity for media attention. In 2003, a lawsuit from December 2023 alleges a harrowing incident involving Sean Diddy Combs, his former Bad Boy Records president, Harve Pierre, and an unidentified third man. The claim suggests they gang-raped an unnamed 17-year-old victim at a Manhattan recording studio, adding a disturbing layer to Combs' narrative. Fast forward to July 6, 2004, where Combs made a grand entrance at his annual Hamptons all-white party. This time, he arrived in possession of the Declaration of Independence, signaling a new level of fortune and braggadocio for the mogul. The year 2005 marks a pivotal meeting between Combs and singer Cassie Ventura. Combs, 37 at the time, expressed interest in signing the 19-year-old to his label, Bad Boy Entertainment. By February 2006, Ventura had signed a 10-album deal with Bad Boy Entertainment, releasing her debut single, Me and You, and a self-titled album later that year. However, according to a lawsuit from November 2023, this period marked the beginning of what Ventura described as a vicious cycle of abuse inflicted by Combs. Ventura alleges years of physical, psychological, and emotional abuse, claiming that Combs forced her to consume illegal drugs, filmed her engaging in sex acts with male sex workers, and subjected her to physical violence for talking to other men. On October 24, 2007, Combs became a marketing ambassador and stakeholder in Kirok Vodka, leading to a significant boost in sales and establishing him as synonymous with the brand. March 6, 2007 saw Combs facing a lawsuit from Gerard Rechnitzer, who alleged that Combs punched him, pushed his girlfriend, and attempted to spit on another woman outside Teddy's nightclub at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. Combs' attorney, Benjamin Braffman, dismissed the claims as an attempt to capitalize on Combs' celebrity status. The case was eventually settled out of court in March 2008, with undisclosed terms. These events provide a complex and troubling backdrop to Combs' multifaceted career and personal life. On May 11, 2007, Making the Band co-star Lorianne Gibson filed a police complaint against Sean Diddy Combs, alleging that he threatened her with a chair while Michael Bivens from New Edition held her in place. Combs' attorney, Benjamin Braffman, defended the incident, claiming that Gibson overreacted to theatrics performed for the cameras. Sources suggested to the New York Daily News that Combs yelled for the cameras to be turned off during the incident. 
Braffman dismissed the accusation as another false claim by someone attempting to exploit Sean's success and celebrity status. In 2010, according to the November 2023 lawsuit filed by Cassie Ventura, Combs exercised control over various aspects of her life. She asserted that he paid for her apartment and all living expenses, maintaining access to her medical records. Ventura claimed that when she experienced memory loss, potentially due to excessive drug use or head injuries caused by Combs' alleged beatings, he had direct access to her MRI results. Furthermore, Combs arranged for his staff to drive Ventura to certain medical appointments, solidifying his control over her. Moving to February 2012, the November 2023 lawsuit detailed Ventura's allegations that Combs threatened rapper Kid Cootie, her then-boyfriend. According to Ventura, Combs expressed intentions to blow up Kid Cootie's car and ensured that Kid Cootie was at home with friends when it happened. Remarkably, around that time, Kid Cootie's car did explode in his driveway. Kid Cootie corroborated this account in a statement to the New York Times. On October 21, 2013, Combs expanded his ventures by launching the cable news network, Revolt TV, which later expanded into radio, digital, and film spaces. On January 8, 2014, Combs announced a new joint venture with Diageo, leading to the creation of De Leon Tequila, once again associating his name with a prominent liquor brand. In 2015, Combs celebrated the 20th anniversary of Bad Boy Records with a box set and a tour featuring legacy signees from the label. In September 2018, the tumultuous relationship between Cassie Ventura and Sean Diddy Combs took a distressing turn. After numerous attempts to sever ties with Combs, Ventura agreed to meet him for dinner, under the impression that it was to discuss concluding her bad boy contract and permanently ending their relationship. However, the post-dinner events unfolded differently, with Ventura alleging that Combs forcibly entered her apartment and raped her. In response to these serious allegations, Ventura took decisive steps to break free from her longtime abuser. This involved leaving the home provided by Combs and returning the car he had purchased for her. By June 26, 2022, Sean Diddy Combs was honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award at the BET Awards. The ceremony featured a performance where he showcased a medley of his hits alongside special guest stars. Moving forward to October 28, 2022, Forbes reported a significant milestone for Combs. He had officially become a certified billionaire. This financial achievement was attributed to his successful deals with Diageo, Revolt TV, and various ventures in the music industry. Between 2022 and 2023, a darker side of Combs' character emerged. In a lawsuit filed in February 2024, producer Rodney Lil Rod Jones, a former collaborator on Combs' album The Love Album Off the Grid, accused the music mogul of repeated groping. Shockingly, Jones claimed that Combs coerced him into soliciting sex workers, taking illegal drugs, and more during the album's production. The lawsuit also implicated Justin Dior Combs, Sean's son, and high-ranking members of Motown Records and Universal Music Group as co-defendants. September 15, 2023, marked a contrasting moment, as Sean Diddy Combs received a key to the city from New York Mayor Eric Adams, highlighting his impact and influence in the city. However, on November 16, 2023, the narrative took a dramatic turn. Cassie Ventura filed a civil lawsuit against Diddy, accusing him of years of sexual misconduct, harassment, sex trafficking, and rape. This legal action, filed under New York's Adult Survivors Act, provided a window for victims of sexual abuse to file civil suits regardless of the statute of limitations. Tiffany Redd, a songwriter and collaborator of Cassie, publicly corroborated her claims. Combs, through his attorney Benjamin Braffman, vehemently denied the allegations, asserting that Ventura had persistently demanded $30 million over six months, threatening to write a damaging book about their relationship. Despite the initial legal battle, one day after the public filing of her suit, Ventura and Combs settled outside of court for an undisclosed amount. Ventura expressed her decision to resolve the matter amicably while maintaining some level of control, and Combs conveyed his best wishes for her and her family, 
signing off with a simple love. The storm of allegations against Sean Diddy Combs continued to intensify in the latter part of 2023 and early 2024. On November 23, 2023, one day before the window for filing suits under the Adult Survivors Act closed, two separate lawsuits were filed against Combs in New York Superior Court. One was filed by Joy Dickerson, alleging misconduct in the early 1990s, and the other by an unnamed plaintiff, both adding to the growing list of accusations. By November 28, 2023, in response to the lawsuits, Combs temporarily stepped down as chairman of Revolt TV. On December 6, 2023, another anonymous accuser came forward, alleging gang rape by Combs and others in 2003. The same day, December 6, 2023, Combs broke his silence on the accusations via his Instagram account, emphatically denying them with the caption, Enough is enough. As the accusations reverberated on December 10, 2023, 18 brands severed ties with Combs' black-owned e-commerce venture, Empower Global. The fallout continued on December 11, 2023, as a public petition circulated, initiated by the feminist and survivor advocacy group Ultraviolet, calling on the Recording Academy to rescind Combs' 2024 Grammy nomination for progressive R&B album in light of the sexual abuse allegations. Responding to the mounting pressure, the Recording Academy released a statement on December 11, 2023, acknowledging the seriousness of the matter and stating that they were carefully evaluating it. On December 13, 2023, Hulu decided to scrap a reality show project featuring Combs that had been in development. The show, centered around the mogul and his family, was canceled in light of the allegations. The repercussions extended to the Grammy Awards, as on January 12, 2024, a representative for Combs announced that he would not be in attendance at the ceremony. Consequently, he was absent from the awards ceremony and all public events leading up to it. Finally, on January 16, 2024, Diageo and Combs resolved their legal lawsuit concerning the marketing of products, officially ending their working relationship. Most recently, the legal troubles for Sean Diddy Combs have escalated as music producer Rodney Lil Rod Jones filed a bombshell lawsuit against the hip-hop mogul. In the 70-page lawsuit filed in the Southern District of New York on Monday, Jones makes explosive allegations, claiming that Combs groped and sexually harassed him, pushed him to take drugs, and withheld $50,000 for his work on the Grammy-nominated album, The Love Album, Off the Grid. This lawsuit marks a significant development as Jones is the first man to publicly accuse the founder of Bad Boy Entertainment of sexual harassment and assault. The allegations include Combs repeatedly groping Jones's anus and crotch without consent, secretly drugging and recording visitors at his homes, using guns as an intimidation tactic, and attempting to groom him into accepting a homosexual relationship by showing explicit videos and claiming it was a normal practice in the music industry. The lawsuit names several other defendants, including Combs' chief of staff, Christina Corum, his son Justin Combs, and Motown Records and Universal Music Group. Notably, City Girls' Young Miami and actor Cuba Gooding Jr. are mentioned in the suit, but are not listed as defendants. Jones, described as a musical prodigy who has played with renowned gospel musicians, asserts that he was hired to work on Combs' album in August 2022, producing nine songs for the project. The lawsuit claims that throughout his time working with Combs, Jones witnessed and experienced actions that went beyond his role as a producer, including constant recording requirements. According to the lawsuit, Jones has accumulated hundreds of hours of footage and audio records capturing illegal activities involving Combs, his staff, and guests. During the time Rodney Lil Rod Jones worked on Sean Diddy Combs' album, he alleges a disturbing pattern of mistreatment and harassment. According to the lawsuit filed in the Southern District of New York, Jones asserts that he lived with Combs for months at a time across various homes in New York, California, and Florida. Shockingly, Jones claims he was not compensated for his time, despite the extensive work on the album. 
Jones contends that while at these locations, Combs engaged in inappropriate behavior, including groping and touching his genitals, showering in front of him, and walking around naked in his house. Jones brought his concerns about these alleged advances to Combs' chief of staff, Christina Corum, who reportedly dismissed the issue by stating, you know, Sean will be Sean. In a lawsuit echoing Cassie's allegations, Jones claims that Combs often coerced him into recruiting sex workers and using illegal substances. A particularly disturbing incident detailed in the suit occurred in February 2023 when Jones alleges Combs drugged him to the point where he woke up disoriented in a bed with two sex workers and Combs. The suit details Combs using various tactics to maintain control over Jones, including promises of Grammy Awards and a sum of $250,000. On the darker side, Combs allegedly made threats of physical harm, even suggesting he would eat Mr. Jones's face. Furthermore, Jones claims Combs conveyed a willingness to harm his own mother, Janice Combs, if necessary to achieve his goals. Throughout the lawsuit, Jones asserts that he possesses physical evidence, including video footage, to support his claims. In February, he posted a video showing Combs laughing while one of his associates read texts that derogatorily referred to Jones as a piece of shit. This detailed and disturbing account adds another layer to the ongoing legal battles surrounding Sean Diddy Combs, shedding light on the gravity of the accusations against the music mogul. The newly filed lawsuit by Rodney Lilrod Jones is seeking a substantial $30 million in damages, as indicated on the cover sheet signed by Jones's lawyer, Tyrone Blackburn. This attorney is the same one representing the woman who sued Sean Diddy Combs in November, making claims that Combs and singer-songwriter Aaron Hall took turns raping the woman and her friend in 1990 or 1991. Combs' lawyer, Sean Holly, responded to the lawsuit by calling Jones a liar who is shamelessly looking for an undeserved payday. Initially, Holly's statement mentioned the lawsuit seeking $30 billion, which was an error and later corrected to reflect the accurate $30 million demand listed on the cover sheet. Holly dismissed Jones's claims as pure fiction and an attempt to generate headlines. In response to Holly's statement, Blackburn emphasized the error on the docket, clarifying that the correct demand is $30 million. He asserted that the focus on $30 billion instead of $30 million was a mistake and emphasized that this lawsuit is just the beginning. Blackburn warned that Combs should do the right thing, indicating that more significant legal actions might follow. Puck's Matt Baloney, meanwhile, has reviewed the script for Antoine Fuqua's upcoming Michael Jackson biopic, and the news isn't favorable for those expecting an unbiased portrayal of the late singer. According to Baloney, the film is set to be adulatory towards Jackson, depicting him as the victim of a conspiracy involving greedy parents. Despite the controversies surrounding Jackson, the script reportedly goes to great lengths to downplay and minimize them, aiming to convince the audience of Jackson's innocence. John Logan, known for his work on The Aviator, scripted the film which has been approved by the Jackson family estate. In the script, Jackson is portrayed as the actual victim, with one of his confidants expressing concern not about the children but the parents, stating, he's opening his doors to tons of people we don't know, and there's a lot of greedy people out there. The overall message of the film, according to Baloney, is that Michael Jackson had an abusive father, leading him to become an insecure yet harmless Peter Pan, who constantly relived the childhood he never had. The script aggressively works to present Jackson as innocent, possibly leading to a watered-down representation of the controversies surrounding him. In 1993, Michael Jackson faced accusations of sexual abuse at Neverland Ranch which continued to haunt him until his death in 2009, casting a shadow over his reputation. Despite consistent denials and never being convicted of any crime, the allegations significantly impacted his legacy. According to Puck Magazine's Matt Baloney, who read the script of Antoine Fuqua's upcoming biopic, the film is expected to present a one-sided, adulatory portrayal of Jackson. Baloney reports that the script aims to convince the audience of Jackson's innocence and goes to great lengths to downplay the controversies, 
particularly painting him as a victim of a conspiracy involving greedy parents. The film, which cost $155 million to produce, is backed by Universal Lionsgate, with hopes for a box office gross nearing $1 billion. Produced by Graham King, Bohemian Rhapsody, and scripted by John Logan, The Aviator, the project has been in development since 2019 and began filming on January 22, 2024. While the synopsis promises a riveting and honest portrayal of Michael Jackson, the reported approach of the script may spark controversy and discussions about the film's handling of the complex aspects of the pop icon's life. Jafar Jackson, Michael's nephew, will portray him as an adult, and Giuliano Cruvaldi will depict Jackson as a child. The cast also includes Coleman Domingo as Joe Jackson, Nia Long as Catherine Jackson, and Miles Teller as John Branca. The two accusers who appeared in the 2019 documentary Leaving Neverland, accusing Michael Jackson of molestation, have been granted the right to combine their negligence lawsuits against Jackson's companies into a single case. Wade Robson and James Safechuck are pushing for a trial by early next year, ahead of the April 2025 debut of the Michael biopic directed by Antoine Fuqua. A judge granted the consolidation during a hearing in Beverly Hills. The lawyer representing Robson and Safechuck believes that the defendants, MJJ Productions and MJJ Ventures, both owned by Jackson's estate, are seeking a trial well beyond February 2025 to ensure that the biopic is released before the trial. The accusers have sued the companies for negligence, breach of duty, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. The previous complaints were revived by an appellate ruling, stating that companies can owe their separate duty to protect victims even if they are solely owned by an alleged perpetrator of abuse. The judge set a follow-up hearing for June 5th, and the accuser's lawyer expressed readiness for the trial, emphasizing the importance of revealing the truth. The Michael Jackson biopic, reportedly presenting an adulatory portrayal of the pop icon, has raised concerns about how it might shape public perceptions of the allegations against Jackson. That's all for the video, folks. Thanks for watching.